Okay, now we're recording for Monday, September 27th, 2021. Um, let's uh, all join and uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Carol, can we have a uh, roll call, please? Jim Batson. Here. Tara Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Cara Drumkey. Here. Lisa Hessel. Sonal Kulkarni. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. Okay, we note that uh, Lisa Hessel is out um, and I'm covering for tonight. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we'll just review the agenda real quick. We have a few communications items, uh, the superintendent report, our student uh, uh, report at, that's after the public comment. We start with a public comment and then a consent vote agenda. Items from the uh, personnel and program, a uh, program and personnel committee, and then items from the facilities and finance committee. A uh, little Illinois Association of School Boards. Uh, uh, anything from CEDAW tonight? Okay, a little, some notes from CEDAW, and then uh, future agenda items, opportunity, uh, followed by adjournment. So we will get started. Is there anyone uh, that wishes to speak on public comment? Buzzing sound. Pull it down just a little bit. There you go. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Jaden Schwartz. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm a senior at Verdon Hills High School. I'm also a writer in journalism for the Scratching Post. I'm writing an article about increased LGBTQIA plus representation and pronoun transparency within Verdon Hills High School. There's been a rise in awareness for sexual and gender identity ever since the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And with the increase in this awareness, conversations about pronouns have also become more normal to discuss with teacher and student relationships. LGBTQIA plus high schoolers at Vernon Hills feel provoked to talk about why queer representation and pronouns are so important. First, I want to define a few words for you. Non-binary means genders that don't fall into one of the male or female categories. Transgender means people whose gender identity is different from the gender they were assigned at birth meaning that people do not need to transition to become male or female, but instead they identify as a different gender than they were assigned. And cisgender is someone that identifies as the gender that they were assigned at birth. Alex Carson, a senior at Vernon Hills High School, uses he, they, she pronouns and identifies as gender fluid. Gender fluid is relating to a person who does not identify themselves as having a fixed gender. Alex claims that there has been an increase of LGBTQIA pride within Vernon Hills, but we also have a lot of areas for improvement. He recommended things like reading more texts with queer characters, including more queer-centered focus in history. Also in health class, we can focus on education with sexualities and LGBTQIA plus sexual education instead of just focusing on cishet sex. Even though the LGBTQIA plus inclusive curriculum bill was passed to include LGBTQIA plus studies in classes, I have not had any teachers discuss these topics, and I admit that my experience could differ from the experience of others. When teachers don't ask their students for their pronouns, it causes a lot of discomfort for transgender and non-binary students. But they are still grateful for the teachers that do ask for their pronouns. Some ways to combat this discom discomfort would be by asking teachers to create forms in which students can submit their pronouns in private. The teachers could also ask the students if they feel comfortable being referred to by these pronouns in front of the class, in private, or both. This avoids telling the whole class if the student is not comfortable to do so. Another area for improvement would be the locker rooms and bathrooms. Although a lot of progress has been made with the gender neutral bathrooms and locker rooms, they are not very accessible for transgender or non-binary students. For instance, the gender neutral changing rooms are far away from both the female and male locker rooms and the dance locker rooms. Every day for class, male presenting students, transgender students, and non-binary students use the gender neutral locker room or the male locker room, which is located farther away from the dance gym than the female presenting students have to walk to. Again, there has been a lot of progress made with providing gender neutral changing rooms, but I believe that we can still do more. 
Some recommendations to support the LGBTQIA plus representation are educating teachers on what transgender and what non-binary means and simply helping them learn about gender and sexual identities. Educating teachers about these identities should not be the role of students coming out to their teachers, but instead the role of the district to teach the faculty. Along with this, social studies, language arts, language and fine arts teachers should include LGBTQIA plus history and moments of injustice in the curriculum. Just like how D128 schools continuously talk about race and ethnicity, LGBTQIA plus studies should be taught as well. I believe that as a district, we provide, sorry, excuse me. I, pre, I believe that as a district that strives to be daring, we can make D128 an inclusive place for students that were part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Please let me know if you have any questions and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the board? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on uh, to the president's report. Uh, we have uh, the student school board representative, so take it away. All right, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Uh, Vernon Hills will be starting off today. So uh, we're the first going to start off with athletics. So congratulations to the boys golf team for winning conference. Dylan Josephson easily placed first place with a score of 73 and beat his uh, second place opponent by five strokes. Um, a couple of strokes behind him, though, uh, AJ Kaprosky placed seventh. Adam Brand placed eighth and Kartik <coughs> Vasudeva placed 10th. Um, this team will be uh, playing regionals on Wednesday at White Deer, which is the course, their home course. Um, also congrats to the girls golf team who also placed first in conference. Uh, Lexi Shulman placed second with a score of 79, uh, right behind her. Anna Lee placed fifth, Tiffany Kang placed eighth and Emily Jones and Irene M tied for 10th. Great job, ladies. Uh, in addition, our seniors have made an effort to advertise our senior nights. So, um, on, um, social media and also just my word to word, um, a bunch of seniors are talking to each other to try to get uh, people out to their events. So such as boys golf, that's not a sport people usually don't come out for. And uh, this year for senior night, uh, I think we had maybe six or seven, which is still a low number, but it was great to see a couple people show up for that. I was one of them and I had a great time. Um, and the ones that do have um, participate uh, um, or large, sorry, <laughs> large crowds um, for senior nights. They're getting bigger ones as uh, for example, uh, student rap, student rap. Sorry. For example, um, the girls volleyball team will be having their senior night on Thursday and they have been advertising it for about a week now. And uh, they're expecting a pretty large crowd um, for, at our football games. Uh, we've had an excellent number of students attend our home games. Uh, with our senior section at full capacity, plus the other classes filling up the rest of the student section, our um, in addition, our turnout to away games has also been outstanding. Even though it was mostly juniors and seniors, uh, our last week's game against Deerfield filled up the whole student section for the for the away, like smaller section. Um, we had our first dance of the year, the kickoff dance, uh, and it was a huge success. Over 800 students attended. Uh, attended this and even with a bit uh, with a rough wet weather in the beginning with lightning, we are still able to make it out into the field and have and have a great time. Um, 800 is over 50% of our uh, student body, which is excellent. Um, this is a great way to to show both the freshmen and sophomores how how dances go at VH. Um, uh, at the dance, we had five senior groups perform their lip syncs and the overall support was amazing. Each group was not there to win, but there to have fun. Every group cheered for each other. And when, when all groups were all done, they all came together and congratulated each other. Nick Heiser, one of the members of Cougar Watch, said that the kickoff dance was the best, best day of his high school uh, um, career by a long shot. Um, the winners of the, um, of the lip sync were the Cougar Watch, and they'll be performing at the Homecoming, homecoming Assembly on October 8th. Um, as another month has passed, students have gotten more used to masks in school. Uh, for most, wearing a mask for six plus hours straight has become second nature to them, but others have, have needed a constant reminder to uh, wear their mask properly. Hopefully, as the, as the months keep passing by, uh, students will continue to wear their masks correctly. Uh, this month, seniors have been training for the right assembly. Uh, the right assembly is, is on one of our half days, October 13th. Uh, where freshmen come in and, and get into small groups 
do some icebreakers, and listen to some motivational speakers. Uh, as seniors, uh, we welcome the freshmen and try to create a safe, safe space for them <clears throat> to, talk about, to talk about anything they would like. Our final training is tomorrow to finalize who is in what group, uh, what teachers are in what group, and uh, what the groups are going to be doing for their activities. Now to Tiffany. Thank you, Kevin. So tonight we have our first orchestra concert, which you probably noticed when you were walking in. And this is our first live concert of the year and our first one since the pandemic began. The students have been working hard since the first day of school and they are beyond excited to show off all their hard work. This brings excitement to the whole school because many students are excited to go and watch them because this is the first fine arts performance in a long time. Uh, the parents of David Dang, a senior who plays violin, says, we can't wait to see the performance after all those days practicing after school. Our JSA club has kicked off the school year with some amazing debates. Being able to discuss with one another in person and not over Zoom has brought a lot of excitement and new faces to JSA. Some of the debate topics so far have been troops in Afghanistan, heartbeat bills, the Second Amendment, COVID vaccines, and abortion rights. These have allowed students to hear different perspectives and learn more about the opposite point of view. We had open house on Thursday, uh, September 2nd, and Vernon Hills parents walked their students' schedules and got to meet all of their teachers. Despite masks and COVID concerns, teachers said that their classrooms were full of eager parents. Students in NHS volunteered at this event to point parents in the right direction in the hallways and help them find classrooms. Dr. Gilliam and the administration, administration team met with freshman parents to address the top 10 questions that all new parents have, which helped reassure them with any concerns that they may have had. Two weeks ago, we had our Yellow Ribbon Week to raise awareness for mental health and suicide prevention. The Spark Exec Board wrote messages of encouragement with chalk in front of the school to brighten people's day as they walked in. Throughout the week, we had different activities for each day. For example, we had staff welcoming students with socially distanced high fives and smiles before school started. We all wore yellow one day. We signed posters as a pledge. We had informational booths in the foyer, and we had so much more. Student rep. With the transition going back to normal school, many teachers have continued their generosity from last year and are allowing students to retake many, if not all, of their quizzes and tests. While this has been a great opportunity for us students to show that we know the material and also to help boost our grades, it has been a struggle to get this done. The testing center in the ARC has been overcrowded basically every day before and after school. Even though it's open during all periods during the day, many students need and want to take it before or after school because they have limited time for lunch and they want to use this time to eat. And so this has resulted in delays for test retakes because the room only allows for about 20 students since it's pretty small and it's first come first serve. So after it gets filled, unfortunately, they have to start kicking people out and telling them to come another day. But a, a lot, a, all of our teachers have been very flexible and understanding with this and allowed for ex extensions, but it has been frustrating for both students and teachers. Student rep. And an update on our new STEM capstone class, many of us have now figured out what experiment that, that we want to research and conduct, such as if food dye has an effect on organisms, if aloe vera can help people with cancer, and how stress hormones can affect cancer cells. As you can see, there's a big variety of what we can research, which is amazing, because we get a lot of freedom to explore whatever we are interested in, especially with the help of mentors. For example, I wanted my project to be something with neuroscience because I know this is something I'm interested in. I was struggled with where I wanted to go with this. So last week, I was able to have a call with a mentor who specializes in neuroscience who helped me brainstorm some ideas and lead me to where I want my project to go. Also, many of us need materials that are not standard in an ordinary science class like mice or cancer cells. So Mr. ProScience has been helping us to see what materials are in the budget and what will be allowed in the lab. And now on to Sophia. Student rep. The VHHS v VH Tool Club has started a new zero waste initiative in the cafeteria to teach students about sustainability and environmental health. The idea originally started back in 2019, but because of COVID, they had to put it aside until now. The cafeteria is using several trash bin stations with National Honor Society members volunteering their lunch periods to help sort trash into the appropriate bins. The trash gets sent to a company who later turns it into compost, and as of now, more than 20 pounds of compost have been produced just from the VHHS cafeteria. Mr. Greenewalt and Mr. Wolf are the staff leaders for this initiative, and after talking to Mr. Greenewalt, I learned that the club plans to roll out a more educational perspective of the initiative to show students what the impact of environmental sustainability is. Students are cooperating with the initiative at the moment, and more support is being added to it as it starts to expand from the cafeteria. Student rep. 
The staff and administration at VHHS has been focusing on encouraging inclusion and diversity as the year moves forward. Two weeks ago, various affinity groups like Jewish Student Union, Latin American Student Organization, Sexuality and Gender Acceptance Organization, Asian Student Union, Black Student Union, and many more met during class periods, during class day periods as Fun Friday activities. Each club invited students who either identify with these affinity groups or wanted to be allies to come in and get to know each other. The experience created a, set, a safe and welcoming environment for new students, as well as a space for them to share similar experiences and build trust. The turnout for all of these groups was great, and more students were reported to have joined these clubs after the Fun Friday activity. To add to this increase in inclusion at VHHS, LGBTQ plus students have reported feeling a sense of inclusion from teachers in their classes. At the beginning of the year, more teachers ask students for pronouns in their get to know you activities. Additionally, some teachers have put up pride flags in their classrooms, as well as LGBTQ plus safe space labels all over the school. This shift in sensitivity has benefited to our school's LGBTQ plus community, but many will agree that there's still some progress to be made. As many of you have heard, VHHS has a new dance gym. The facility is incredible, and many of us, including Ms. Jaffe, are very thankful for having a space to practice. However, senior student, Jaden Schwartz, couldn't help but point out to me that the changing rooms for these dance classes are only accessible to female identifying students. Any students not fitting that description need to run across the school to the normal locker rooms to change for class and then risk being late to their next class by having to follow this routine every day. Although dance is a mostly female dominated class, non-female students shouldn't have to worry about having a place to comfortably change for classes. Additionally, Non-binary and transgender students from all gym classes have to go through the process of changing in other rooms, even further down by the basement. After noticing this, we reached out to several non-binary students about the situation, and they expressed their experience as being more of an uncomfortable and time-consuming hassle than using the male-slash-female changing rooms, and that in the near future, the space in these rooms might run out. While we are appreciative that the board, as well as the school administration, have made progress on these issues before, Students like Jaden and myself hope that the board can take this into consideration and come up with a way to improve further upon these issues. The Ronald McDonald Care Mobile also visited our school this past month. It is a portable nurse program that allows some of our students to get their physicals done who may have otherwise not had the opportunity to do so. It's an important equity initiative as it meets the needs of those who don't have access to resources that many others do. And lastly, congratulations to Anirud Adiraju, Ella Bohm, Laura Doler, Joel Kim, Jackie Liu, Devin Mulcrone, and Andrew Tikhanov on becoming VHHS's 2021 National Merit Semifinalists. These students scored at the top 0.5% of their class nationally on the PSAT and have achieved a very high honor status from doing so. Way to go, guys. And now on to Libertyville. Student rap. All right, so the energy and excitement from the start of the school year has carried out through the first month at Libertyville High School. Uh, first, I just want to talk a little bit about how students are feeling like being back at school. Um, just a general consensus from the students that they're really glad to be back and excited to be back at school and enjoying going to classes every day. Um, school spirit and school culture is at an all-time high at Libertyville High School. Uh, I'd like to just shout out the administration, our faculty, and the upperclassmen. They've been, a really, been, they've been doing a really good job aiding the underclassmen and you know, contributing to this um, culture that we have. That is so fantastic. Classes are seeing a big shakeup this year. There's lots of different policies being impl implemented through them. Uh, teachers are, retired, are required to have a retake policy. Overwhelming, overwhelmingly, students are enjoying this uh, retake policy and taking uh, teachers up on this opportunity. Teachers enjoy uh, having this retake policy, but they have said that a small minority of their students are not using their time correctly and taking advantage of this policy. Some English teachers have er, uh, expressed some difficulty with the retake policy in terms of writing. They don't think it's really the best to have kids continually re revising essays and whatnot. They'd rather that they take what they learned and focus it forward, but the overwhelming majority of people are enjoying these and really taking good use of them. Also, student or, uh, teachers have been, a lot of teachers have been implementing uh, what is called an equitable grading scale. Uh, I think it's at a school board level, like the whole grading policy. 
So essentially students try are supposed to hit learning targets and homework doesn't really count for points. It's to supplement your education and uh, tests are like out of a certain number. So kids don't have such a dramatic drop from 50 to zero, which is failing a class. They have more of an opportunity and they can keep reaching it. And that comes into the retake, re like attaining it. Uh, teachers have been doing their best to explain it but kids have said there's not as much transparency as they'd like is kind of thrown on them this year and it, it'll take a little more time for them to get used to it uh, school programs have been taken off have taken off this in the early part of the year one in particular in early september we had our self-care week followed by as what they had the yellow ribbon week uh, dr nelson our prevention and wellness coordinator put that on for us during self-care week Students were encouraged to think about themselves and their current state of their mental and physical health. After coming back from not being at school for such a long time, students were really grateful for having this reminder to be more cognizant of their mental health and physical health. I know just talking with students, they love being back, but it's, it's, a, big, it's a big difference from being at home all year. And, well, you know, you had the little part at the end of the year, but uh, there's a lot more on their plate. There's a lot more stressors. Sports are back and there's just a lot more they need to handle. So it was very great that Dr. Nelson was able to put that on. That was followed by our yellow ribbon week, which they talked a little bit about. It's about suicide prevention and like overall mental wellness. <clears throat> Throughout the week, the, the Friday before, students and faculty were encouraged to come tie-dye yellow shirts to be worn during the week uh, to support solidarity with the program. Uh, Students decorated the halls and were given stickers and pins with nice little sayings on them to kind of encourage kids to always be aware and have a great day. Um, throughout the week during their lunch periods, they had um, activities and discussions about being open with your mental health and making sure that, that they know all the resources, both student and faculty run that you can go to at, at the high school. Um, I heard from students that they appreciated knowing that there was a place for them to go if they ever had any trouble because lots are having trouble with all the stress that comes with being back at school. And I was a part of one discussion and learning more about your classmates is a really great thing. And it, it helps you put, put yourself more in their shoes and to be able to understand everything about them. And it's, it's really important that we have more open discussions like this in a place where kids can come. Uh, teachers have made a point about or made a point of emphasis about checking in with their classes more because they know about all the added stress that has come with this year, even with all the great things that have happened. Just a little switch up. Uh, the juniors are taking the PSAT, I believe, October 13th, and the underclassmen will have a kind of an assembly where through Dr. Nelson, our prevention and wellness coordinator, seniors and other students or mostly seniors because juniors will be taking the test will uh, have an open discussion about these resources because they didn't they knew about it through uh, yellow ribbon week but they weren't as aware as you know upperclassmen because they've been through this so they'll just dis discuss that and our green dot program which is i think i mentioned last time our, our bi like our anti-bullying and culture of the high school so that will happen uh about masks, seniors, uh, or not seniors, but um, the entire school, I believe, is doing a pretty good job. The faculty is making sure that they keep hammering that point that everyone needs to be wearing their mask and wearing them correctly so they have a use. Uh, some students, you know, there's always going to be a few that leave it down, but other students also encourage that they put their masks up and be healthy and be safe. Um, clubs have seen a rapid increase in participation this year from prior years. Uh, I know Leaf Club, which I'm in, is has an all-time high. And just a little bit about that, all this, um, we created a natural prairie in our courtyard and many classes are taking advantage of that and going outside and learning uh, in the uh, nature. And I've heard from many students that it is great when the teacher has on the door, head out to the prairie classroom, we're gonna go have class there. Uh, Dr. Calentes and uh, Dr. Herman were actually in an AP environmental science class trying to hear a little bit more about what their efforts are and how the classes kind of run. So I was actually in that class 
we ran a simulation and they weren't with my group, but I think they got to know a little bit more about how the classes run and where we're trying to head with uh, classes like that in the future of the school. Um, and I just want to kind of bring it back to the point of this high school during the summer, Dr. K stressed the importance of restoration renewal of Libertyville culture and the entire class is doing a fantastic job with that school spirit has an all time high. When I was a freshman or sophomore, I don't remember a time where kids of all grades were showing up to every sporting event. It's not the football games anymore. It's the volleyball games. It's the soccer games. I saw a few at the cross country meet, like every, everyone's going and it's, it's the seniors leading by example and freshmen are coming on sophomore. And it's just so good for like our camaraderie and our spirit. Um, I just thought I'd like to mention that I taught, I know many people from other schools and I never hear kids or the majority of kids say they really enjoy going to school and they enjoy everything the school has to offer and they appreciate going there. So I just want to wrap it up with that. So I'll pass over to Ryan for some sports updates. Okay. Um, so our fall sports seasons are well underway with cross country, golf, football, boys, soccer, hockey, girls, swimming and diving, girls, tennis, girls, volleyball, palms, and cheer practicing and competing. Members of these teams have said that their experiences have felt almost normal um, compared to uh, last year, with the exception of masking for indoor practices. Um, they also, also feel overwhelming support from the school and their peers, with turnout for all sporting events being super high. Um, also, members have said that they feel closer bonds with their teammates, um, with longer seasons, more contests, and generally closer contact than what we experienced last year. Um, there's also been a lot of student enthusiasm for football games this year. On game days, the marching band drumline plays in the hallways before school. LHS plays the school song between classes. And overall, there's an excited feeling among students. Our team has had a few big wins, one notably being 76 to 6 against Waukegan, setting the school record for most points in a game. This record was previously set in 1923. Congratulations to our football team. Our first home game was against Lake Zurich. Um, it was really well attended and students said it felt uh, normal and they were really excited to be back in the stands cheering on our team. Um, our second game against Joaquin was a little bit less attended, especially in the second half. However, many senior students uh, stayed in support of our team. Um, the marching band, POMS team and cheer team all performed at these games and were really excited to perform for such a large audience and compared to last year where it mainly was parents. Um, we also have had a great turnout to our away games, including underclassmen who usually don't show up to those kind of events. Um, but a lot of them were showing up. And in addition to the upperclassmen who usually fill the stands. Um, Libertyville's principal's advisory board held their first meeting last week. Um, this group is made up of students of all grades who provide a voice for the rest of the school and any student issues or opinions um, or like current events at the school. Um, these students then provide their input to Dr. K to create initiatives or ideas to continuously improve LHS. We are excited to see what these students will do in the coming months. Um, Libertyville also has a very busy week ahead of us. Um, it's our spirit week to get ready for the homecoming dance Saturday um, with this year's theme being Rock the Ville. And this is all organized by our amazing student council. Um, today was Tropical Day, which had a great turnout. Um, I saw a lot of tropical shirts, sunglasses, and lays from all of our students. Um, the upperclassmen definitely led the way in spirit with the most people dressing up. Um, but the freshmen and sophomores are catching on to our Libertyville pride. And I think they're getting a little bit more like bold, like in being able to dress up. Um, Student rap. Oh, um, Monday and Tuesday, we have float building to design and build floats for the homecoming parade Saturday. We also have an annual girls powder puff flag football game this Wednesday for senior students. Seniors form teams complete with coaches and cheerleaders, and some teams have held practices outside of school these past few weeks. Seniors are very excited about this because it's a return to another one of our classic homecoming traditions. Um, we've also created a new Libertyville tradition by switching our homecoming court um, around a little bit this year. Uh, 20 senior students who represent every aspect of Libertyville's culture has been voted on by teachers and peers and will be honored at our assembly Friday and parade Saturday. Um, congrats to our 2021 homecoming court. Uh, Friday, we have our homecoming assembly to celebrate our Wildcat spirit, um, watch performances by our band cheer and pawns teams, and find out which grade will win the Spirit Cup. For our first year back, the Spirit Cup is up for grabs, and it's going to be a very intense competition seeing if the seniors will win it this year. 
um, Friday, we not only have our football game against Lake Forest, but also a soccer game against Carmel. Um, these events are at 4.30 and 7.30, and enthusiasm and spirit have been building up all week for the Cats to win. Finally, Saturday, we have the homecoming parade and dance that evening. Um, the dance is slightly different than it would be in a normal year, beginning at 6.30 p.m., and it's being held outdoors. Uh, typically at this time of year, link crew leaders at LHS talk to their freshman groups and just talk them through the whole homecoming process, including buying tickets, getting dinner reservation, res reservations, and just how the dance works. Um, this is really helpful for many freshmen because the dance is such a new concept for them. In addition to that, this year, a few link crew leaders held special sessions for members of the sophomore class who also haven't gotten an uh, opportunity to participate in a high school dance either. Um, talking to some underclassmen, most are excited but a little bit nervous for their first homecoming. Um, some are a bit sad that it isn't in the gym as always, but overall the students are thankful that we are returning to an almost normal dance. Um, I can feel a lot of energy and excitement in the hallways this week, and I'm sure it will continue to grow in anticipation of the weekend. Um, finally, over the past few weeks, LHS has been ho hosting representatives from many major colleges to talk to our senior and junior students. Um, around 75% of the representatives are in person and 25% are virtual, um, which actually has worked really well with few technical issues. Um, hearing from senior students and also from my experience, uh, the visits are super helpful in, you know, making decisions, asking questions to those representatives, and also just learning information about college or college options. Um, and the most of the people that have been there have been seniors. However, there are a few juniors that have chosen to attend as well. And I'm going to pass it off to Faith. I don't know if my mic is on just because the green light Do is on. Do you want out. me to pass you mine and yeah. you can use that? Student rep. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everybody. So I just want to start off to say a huge part of Libertyville's community and what makes it so special is the excellence of academics we have at LHS. The performing arts as well is not only shows the intelligence of LHS, but also carries over the overall creativity that we have at our school as well. I work at Towny Square Restaurant in downtown Libertyville and get to firsthand experience the positive words I hear about LHS from the community and how excited parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and everyone is to see their students so involved in our community, whether that's window painting or doing extra credit choir shows at the local church or old folks home, seeing LHS athletes pictures in the windows of your favorite local shops. It's all just so exciting for our community and for the parents of our students. Student rep. This is what LHS and the people are and what it makes it so special. At LHS, we recently had a performing arts fall band concert on September 23rd, where students got to display their amazing, amazing musical abilities sorry, to families, friends, and more. Without the LHS band, football games would not be the same. The excitement and passion they bring to their skill and our student body is so impressive and so memorable. Going to LHS theater, the mu school musical Matilda will be happening on October 28th, 29th, and 30th for parents and adults to see for anyone who's interested. Not only the cast, but the crew and directors put so much work and effort into what they present to the community and practice every day after school for several hours. They put so much effort into this musical, and it's seriously so important for our student body to go and participate in watching this because I have a few friends in theater, and it's crazy the amount of um, passion they put into these musicals. Student rap. Choir as well will be having a concert coming up very soon, but the date is not decided yet. As a student that has been in choir all four years and done other groups such as acapellas and as an exec member of the choir board, I can easily tell you choir has helped me so much find something that can boost my mood if I'm having a difficult day. Choir and band will be going to Richardson Farms for a field trip on October 12th, which is something we haven't been able to do since 2019, which was my sophomore year. So being able to go there again and have these memorable um, things with your friends and being able to take pictures is something that's really crazy to think about. Community Ed began September 8th, and I've heard many good things from people in the community and even though some regulars at the diner involved in them. September 8th was also the start of Yellow Ribbon Week, which were both easily big successes, as John mentioned. Personally, Yellow Ribbon Week hits very close and is a very important topic I believe our school needs to bring awareness to for our <laughs> students. 
Going into academics, LHS is cruising very smoothly, and I have heard very normal jargon from students about their classes. Partially, yes, complaining about homework and texts and quizzes, but, you know, that's never going to stop. It's always going to be a regular thing. But also, actually being in front of their teachers instead of over a screen has been so, so great for all of our students. Me as well. Um, I struggled with Zoom and, you know, having to learn math, oh my gosh, of all things, um, over a screen and being able to like in person come and see my teachers and get that help and really experience that learning uh, face to face has been so, so important to me. Um, the PSAT, as John, Melchin, or John <laughs> mentioned, is being held on October 13th, and LHS is wishing all students taking it good luck and to make sure to get a good breakfast before and plenty of sleep beforehand. The National ACT was held on September 11th, and from some friends I know that took it also went fairly smoothly. As much as LHS takes extracurriculars and the student voice seriously, they also want every student to have academic success in their education. Thank you for listening and make sure to go to the Hoko football game to see our athletes, performing arts, and powder puff while I will be participating on the field. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Mm -hmm. Well done. Yeah, I always, it, it's so exciting to hear all the things that are going on at our, our two schools. It's, uh, it's, it's really nice that you can uh, come share that with us and, uh, um, each uh, each month so we appreciate it um so moving on we have the uh, superintendent's report yes thank you and i have a little bit of additional good news the students covered most of it so thank you very very much um, i will start off by adding the lhs students who are recognized as the 2021-22 national merit semi-finalist that is luke anderson owen haywood george huber Ryan McGregory, Emma Moscato, Molly Moscato, Elim Na, Nikhil Patel, and Andrew Sorensen. And thank you, you already read the Vernon Hills, so thank you to all, or all of the students for performing so well. We wish them luck in the next level of competition for the National Merit. Also at Libertyville High School, they are proud to announce that the first class of inductees will be into the Athletic Hall of Fame. They'll be introduced and celebrated during homecoming activities the week of October 1st. The LHS Athletic Hall of Fame was recognized, was organized to recognize and honor those Wildcat athletes, teams, and coaches who excel in their respective sports or coaching roles and who help bring honor, recognition, distinction, and excellence to LHS. And uh, because this is their inaugural um, year, we'll go ahead and uh, read the people who will be recognized uh, Jim McMillan, class of 1920, Dan Holm, class of 1971, Brett Butler of 75, Pam Miller from 76, Allison Marquette of 91, Becky Coleman, 93, Kelly Carl, 94, Eric Van Gotham, 97, Kevin Walter, 99, and then on to the coaches, Coach Max Sanders, class of 59, Coach Jim Panther, Coach Chris Terzna, <laughs> thank you, um, Coach Randy Kucheski, Coach Andy Bitta, and the 1991 girls soccer team. Um, also, a really important announcement, the D128 Foundation for Learning will have its annual fundraiser, the big event, on Saturday, November 6th. Uh, uh, it will take place from 7 to 9 p.m., and it will be <clears throat> virtual. Um, it will include a live trivia competition, silent auction, a raffle, and paddle raise for students in need. A registration will start on October 1st, with all the details being available on the website. All proceeds benefit programs for LHS and VHHS students. And then finally, the Illinois Association of School Board Leaders recognize um, school board members for the individual time and talent they've devoted to learning and leadership activities provided by the association. At the fall division meeting, two D128 board members received recognition. Jim Batson received a certificate for maintaining his master board member status. 
And Don Carmichael received a lapel pin for earning master board member level one status. Please join me in recognizing our board members. Dr. Denise Herman, superintendent. <clears throat> uh, and that's all of my good news for tonight. Um, next up, I wanted to share briefly um, with the board and the community that we continue to move forward with our strategic planning process. Um, I want to compliment people on the data team for pulling together um, gosh, it seems like hundreds and hundreds of sets of data. We reviewed some of it this afternoon to answer the question, where are we now? Our next session will take place on um, November 2nd, and that will be an all-day session, and it will be in person. Um, so again, we're continuing to move through that process. Um, at our meeting in August, we talked about having a special board session rather than having it be on the evening. Um, however, I think I realized that there's a conflict for two board members. So I will be working with Lisa and Jim and others to make sure it's essential to me that all seven board members can be there to participate. So look for another opportunity there. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Bryant for a COVID-19 update. Thank you. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Brian Kelly, Associate Superintendent. I'll try to make the print as big as possible so you guys can see, but I, I will just go through the slides here. Um, so just, uh, just kind of an update because it has been a while since we've had a board meeting since August. So I just wanted to give an update. Um, we have shared the District 128 Culture of Care Response Plan. Um, the response plan has been updated a couple of times since we've met, and that's to align with the ISB and IDPH guidance. Um, along with that response plan, we have also been communicating with our staff, parents, guarding, guardians on some of the school health guidelines. So I think we've, in the past, last week we sent another update. Um, we sent one a couple of weeks ago just on some of the guidance that we've received um, you know, from ISB, Illinois State Board of Education, and then Illinois Department of Public Health. We've also then, you know, posted that information on the district website um, under D128 Next. Um, and the D128 Next has links to our culture of care response plan. It also has links to our COVID-19 reporting um, that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, also on our LHS and Vernon Hills websites, the main websites, the um, information that has been sent to parents regarding um, the symptoms um, and how to talk to the school nurses about the symptoms and the follow-up and testing that's required to return to school is all right there on both websites um, as a quick link so that everybody can see it. So we're trying to share the information in as many places as possible. Um, try not to inundate our families with too many emails, but also try to get that information out there as um you know, things are updated from the state. Um, just to review a little bit, you know, some of our prevention strategies, number one um, is to promote vaccination. And I'll get into our update on our vaccination rates. Um, as the students talked about, consistent and correct mask use um, is one of our important prevention strategies. Physical distancing as much as possible. It's a lot more difficult um, in a larger school when you get everyone back into the buildings. But again, this is just one of the strategies and you want to use as many of these together um, as possible. The other one is uh, screening and testing, and I'll give you an update on our screening and testing a little bit. Ventilation, which you know Mark and his team has been working on for a couple of years, um, which has been great. Again, we want to reiterate um, hand washing, respiratory etiquette, and keep you know talking about that. We can't forget about that as one of the basics, but we can't you know let that go by the wayside. Um, again, staying home and sick, and that's why we're communicating those. Um, and we want our families to be in contact with our school nurses and ask questions. Our school nurses are more than happy to take time and talk to families, um, talk to students, talk to staff. Um, and, you know, bear with us. Our schools have been doing, I think, a great job, not only with our um, learning support team, um, secretaries talking to families, but also our nurses. So, you know, we're there to help as much as possible. Um, you know, contact tracing with isolation and quarantine. Again, our nurses work with the Lake County Health Department based off of guidance from Illinois Department of Public Health. And that's, again, to keep students, staff, you know, out of the building when they need to be quarantined so that we can, you know, keep everyone else in the building healthy. And then again, cleaning and disinfecting every day, but also in other areas, 
um, you know, when we need to. So those are our prevention strategies, just a quick overview of and reminder of them again. Um, you know, one of the things too, as we get into flu season in promoting vaccination, the other thing is to talk about flu vaccines. And every year we um, provide free flu, free flu vaccines for our staff through our um, co-op, our insurance co-op. So hopefully our staff, um, you know, they get information on that, but again, for families to take advantage of flu vaccines in the area, and you'll see them popping up now at Walgreens and other places. So um, talking about the data that we monitor, and this is what we've talked about um, before we look at the community transmission, vaccination coverage, testing, and any outbreaks. And so, oops, let me go back here. I was trying to get to our website if I can. There it goes. So on our website, this is the data that we've been monitoring, monitor, monitoring and we updated every couple of weeks. So last time I updated was um, September 17th, and I'll update it again at the end of this week. We look at Lake County, the positivity rate, and then the number of cases per 100,000. And you can see from August 10th to September 17th, you know, where that's kind of come down a little bit. Um, in Lake County, Libertyville um, has, you know, gone up a little bit and then come back down. Vernon Hills has um, risen a little bit over time. And I'll see what it is at the end of uh, this week. Our vaccination coverage, uh, to give you, a, you know, Lake County is at 57%, so it's growing. But just to compare that with our D128 staff, they're at 91.5%. Um, our, uh, our D128 students, Vernon Hills is at 75%, Libertyville is at 80%. And again, I'll get an update at the end of this week. So again, we talk about one of those things, the high vaccination rate has helped us in a lot of areas, you know, keeping people healthy, but also limiting the number of quarantines. Um, I'll, I'll get in a little bit uh, on another slide about some of the testing that, you know, we're doing and the updates on that. And then again, if you've been watching in the news at all about other schools having uh, clusters or outbreaks, currently we don't have any, and an outbreak is defined as two cases connected at a school um, within the school environment. So um, the county works with our nurses on cases, um, positive cases, and how they were connected. So if they were two positive cases, but they occurred outside of a school, um, they're not considered a school outbreak. So it's got to be a connection within, you know, a school environment. So that was, again, part of some of the uh, last updates. Um, let's go back to Brian Kelly, Associate Superintendent. Testing update. Um, so again, we talked about, you know, um, weekly testing was required for unvaccinated um, students in extracurricular activities. So back in August, we started with unvaccinated indoor fall sport athletes, and we were using the Binex Now test. Um, and then starting last week, because we switched over to shield testing, um, we included all unvaccinated fall sport athletes. So that included indoor and outdoor. And then we added in some of our extracurricular activities, depending on the type of activity, you know, the contact, some of the traveling via bus to some other activities. And we'll continue to add those as we go, as activities change and activities expand. So some of the fine arts was added in there, um, again, for our unvaccinated. Those going to um, homecoming, um, dances, powder puff, the unvaccinated um, students were added into our testing. So again, um, our unvaccinated staff members, they've uh, been using Binex now when we started three weeks ago. And then this last week, we moved over to shield testing. So shield got set up last week and we work with Passport Health. Um, and it's been, um, you know, knock on wood, everything's been going well at both schools. We test two, two times a week. We give people uh, two windows of opportunity at both schools to test. So we go Monday and Thursday. Um, to, there's an opportunity Monday, um, I'm trying to remember the times, Monday morning, no, I'm sorry, Monday afternoon at Libertyville and Thursday morning at uh, Libertyville. And then at Vernon Hills is during the middle of the day on Monday during lunch periods and the middle of the day on Thursday at lunch periods. And so um, our students, um, again, we expanded and we'll add more people in next week. So that's a little bit of the testing update. Brian Kelly, Associate Superintendent. Any questions? <clears throat> Brian Kelly, Associate Superintendent. 
Great. Thank you, Bryant. And we'll move next to Mark Koopman with our update for facilities. Thank you, Dr. Hellman. Um, the board uh, went on a tour at our last committee meeting. So we've had some progress since you were last there. Um, we have, uh, they started doing the gym equipment has uh, been starting to be installed. Um, they have duck socks up uh, for the HVAC system. So they're doing transitions um, and doing the connections for that. Uh, the construction trailer has gone outside and today they uh, were working on grading, uh, spreading some uh, black dirt, getting ready to seed, um, repairing some of the roadway that was uh, damaged during construction, uh, part of it, uh, pouring the outside stairs, uh, emergency exits and, and getting finishing up outside work, or sidewalks and that. Uh, roofing is, has been underway. So now the driver's ed areas are totally covered, waterproof, and the flashing was finished today. So um, we're working, working our way across the roof. Uh, approximately eight more days of roofing, you know, depends on weather. Um, ultimate goal, um, we have the uh, flooring scheduled, you know, painters are already painting more. There's, you know, the walls uh, had inside of a uh, first coat of orange around the bottom, which you didn't see. Uh, so it's starting, uh, starting to shape up. It looks great. Mark Koopman, B&G. Any questions? All right. We had three freedom of information requests this month. Um, one was received. Um, it was a commercial request on the 17th of August, and it was for the bid processes. Um, the second one was another commercial request, and it was for our copy of our copy lease agreements. The third was for infor, uh, staff information. It was requested on September 20th, and it is for the list of all CHSD 128's employees' first names, last names, email addresses. Um, all were um, satisfied within three days of receipt. In the past, we've always had an indication of how long it took a staff member to put that information together, but that's no longer a part of these reports. Not that it matters, but I kind of like to know, like, does it take somebody a half hour or are we spending three days on these? Don Carmichael, secretary. Can we just put that back into future ones? <laughs> that's what I'm asking. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Carol had marked that down. She always asked myself or Dan Stanley about the amount of time and we can add that back in. Thank you. So, okay. Jim Batson, Vice President. Okay, moving on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Herman. Um, we have the uh, consent vote agenda. All these items were reviewed uh, earlier in the month in, uh, in committee. And uh, so we have a consent vote agenda here for um, consideration. Uh, we have a, a roll, uh, not a roll call, but a, a motion to move to approve the consent vote agenda. Second. Okay, uh, any questions or comments from the board? No, hearing none, roll call please, Carol. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Okay, that passes. Uh, we'll move on and I'll hand it over to myself for the Program and Personnel <laughs> Committee. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, a couple items here. The first one is employment of employees. These are uh, additional um, uh, employment changes uh, uh, since our committee meeting earlier in the month. So if we can have a um, motion, please. Casey Rooney, Facilities and Finance Chair. I move to accept the employee designations, hires, et cetera, as presented. Second. Okay. Any comments or questions from the board? Okay, hearing none. Can we have a roll call, please, Carol? Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Okay, motion passes. And we have one more item here, memorandum of agreement uh, for uh, the uh, school year 21-22 sick days. Any Sure. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background. So we, um, you know, last year, um, 
we had an agreement regarding uh, COVID sick days um, for teachers that um, were sick themselves, had a quarantine, or had um, childcare issues during, you know, during due to quarantining or COVID with their children. And so, um, but that was only a one-year agreement. Um, the difference too with um, last year is that we were remote and hybrid. And so now we're looking at full in person uh, this year and trying to, you know, look at all the different scenarios um, to try to, um, obviously the one thing we want to look at is our adults um, have the opportunity to be vaccinated. And being vaccinated allows you also not to have to uh, quarantine in certain circumstances. So if you read through this, one of the things is there are different scenarios for staff members that are vaccinated or not vaccinated. Um, and by our high vaccination rate of 90% for our staff, um, it really, um, I think, allows you know, our vaccinated staff to be able to stay in work and not have to quarantine. Um, but if there are some circumstances, as we are aware, there are now vaccinated um, individuals that are, um, you know, getting COVID um, that, you know, we want to be able to, um, you know, take care of them as much as possible, but also look at opportunities when somebody might be at home, can they still work? Um, and can they still teach remotely? Because we do have some of the um, electronic um, capabilities that we didn't have maybe two, three years ago it's for them to be able to, um, you know, teach at home and still have access to our students and also for our other staff. So we, um, you know, worked, I think, closely with our union, teachers union, on trying to come up with um, all the different scenarios um, for this. And um, I don't know, is there any questions on any of it? Have we had an instance yet where a teacher was quarantined and was teaching remotely? We, yes, we're going to be, yes. So we've had a couple of instances that we've been able to do that and see how it worked. And then, and now obviously we're going to be putting this in place right away. Well, that, that's the thing I'm wondering is yeah. how, how did it go? Like, as far as I know, I, I, it was great for the kids to be able to have their teacher there still teaching right. them. So. And then you just have a, a sub sit in the classroom <laughs> and then the teacher pipes in. Yeah, I'll, Correct. Conf I'll confirm that from a school standpoint. The, the few circumstances we've had where the teacher has really chosen to teach from home, um, the, the instruction has been able to continue. Short of that, the construction stops, hiccup. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some sub plans and those kinds of things, but th that's really not the authentic instruction. So when that teacher is live, even via zoom, that makes all the difference. They can continue the instruction and the curriculum moves forward. Uh, and yes, there's an adult in the building, but that's been great. And I'm, I'm really excited for this to, uh, be more formalized. Great. And the thing is we're no matter what, even if they were at home, we'd have to pay for a sub. So it's not costing us anything extra right. in the end. So, you know, you'd have a sub. So now we have a sub that's, you know, monitoring them in person, but we have the teacher that still has access to our students. It's terrific. So Brian Kelly, associate superintendent. Hey, and, and, and the other thing, just real quickly. So this would be an MO, um, a with our teachers union, but we also want to look at, um, you know, for our educational support personnel or, you know, administrators that are in this situation because they're not part of the union to be able to, you know, afford the same, you know, opportunities for them. So, and that's what we've traditionally done. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments related to that? So just to clarify, this motion is for the memorandum mm -hmm. as well as the expectation that it, that those concepts will be applied to the ESP and administrators Correct. as well. Yep. Just to be clear. So we would call this, an adoption of a memorandum or <laughs> yes okay yep. cool okay so in that case can we have a motion please i move to adopt uh the memorandum of agreement regarding 2021 to 22 sick days a second okay thank you any further questions or comments okay hearing none roll call please carolyn carmichael aye drunky aye Kolkarni. aye Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. 
Okay, motion passes. Uh, I will hand this over to Chairperson Rooney for the Finance and Facilities Facilities Finance Committee. Okay. I'm sure you've noticed that we have a few less items on the agenda than usual. Our uh, Associate Superintendent for Finance, Dan Stanley, is not here this evening as he is enjoying some time off with his new beautiful baby girl. So we wish him congratulations on that. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the employee compensation report. This, we have no action required on this. This is just something that the law requires uh, that it's presented to the board and then it gets posted on our website by October 1st. So we saw this in committee meetings. Does anybody have any questions or comments about it? Okay, then it will move on to being um, published. published on our, thank you, published on our website. Uh, second item, uh, change orders. Mark, you want to uh, chat with us? The maintenance school? project grant. Oh, the maintenance project grant. Maintenance I'm sorry. project grant, yeah. Uh, second item is actually the school maintenance project grant. Um, and this is something we're just being asked to approve the application process, correct, Mark? Correct. Yes. Um, Mark Koopman, B and G. So Dan, you know, Dan spelled out, uh, you know, what the, the grants are for uh, maintenance and buildings and upkeep and, and things like that. Uh, we have uh, upcoming projects that we're starting with our roofs here at Vernon Hills because it's uh, it's due. So we selected um, the roofs that need attention right away uh, that are in the worst condition. And we've come up with a game plan to work around the, been work with our consultants to budget and work our, our way around the building. Um, so we felt that uh, when Dan and I discussed it, um, the rough areas in in the front of the building here in the center over the foyer and that was a perfect uh, place to start uh, the project and we used the grant money for that. So um, I think Dan wants to just approval for put the application process in and to use those roofs as part of the application process. Right. Um, we've adjust. used roofs in the past. I think we also use tuck pointing. So it's like roofing, tuck pointing, window replacement, things along that line. And um, that the grant, uh, uh, when you apply for those things, they, you know, they look at, they consider those things first. So. I remember we did the tuck pointing one before, but it's, it's a, it doesn't necessarily bind us to the project. Um, we will be asked to vote, vote on the actual bids for this work at some point. This is just giving permission for the application process to proceed. And to use those projects in the application process. And we have two years to complete the work. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 school maintenance project grant application? So moved. Second? I'll second it then. <laughs> All righty. Thank How does you. Carol know? Carol, roll call, please. <laughs> Drumkey. Aye. Bolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay. Moving on to the change orders. Um, change order or orders? It looks like there's a couple different things in here, Mark. Well, it's it, what. What um, Gilbane did, this is all with uh, the company that was doing our sewer and water work. Okay. So we had a bunch of change orders. So they combined them all into, into one large change order instead of doing eight change orders um, at the end of the process. So, um, Mark Koopman, b and The reason for these, these change orders, uh, the first four were county improvements. We submitted our drawings to the county for sewer and water, and they wanted us to make some changes and do some upgrades. Um, so there was additional money in that. Um, and number five, we had additional utility location costs. Um, the company was paid to, I believe it was go 15 feet deep, if I remember correctly, looking for the pipes for the, the pool. And they were actually deeper than that. So we had the additional costs of going deeper. So we, when we put our pylons in, we didn't rupture you know, the main drain for the pool um, and flood the area out. So um, that was the cost there. And then um, items six through eight uh, were changes to village village made. Um, 
and they're all due to you know sewer and water sewer and water work on the campus. So the total dollar amount does require board uh, approval then. Yes. Um, yeah, the total dollar amount is $46,927. There is one, one change order in there that is zero dollar value. So um, that's a good thing. Right. Yeah, we like zero dollar change orders. So but this is coming out of contingency. It's not an additional amount. Yes, this is coming out of contingency. It's always been in the contingency budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so can I get a motion to approve the change order in the amount of $46,927 to come out of the contingency plan? Absolutely. Second. Second. All right. Thank you. Carol, roll call, please. Cole Carney. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. All right, motion passes. That concludes facilities and finance. This may actually be a record. Yeah, <laughs> just, so we're doing. We're doing. We haven't heard from. It's Cara okay. Benjamin we have tax yet. level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, Cara, don't disappoint us here. So no pressure. <laughs> thank you, uh, I Chair. I mean facilities and finance. Yeah. I'm, I can only speak to that. <laughs> uh, moving on, item number six is the Illinois Association of School Boards, and I uh, just wanted to draw your attention to everyone received in their board packet uh, this last Friday. The uh, 2021 resolutions committee report. Um, uh, I will be representing the district in November at the joint conference um, and voting on these items. Many of them are sort of a consent agenda kind of thing, but uh, there's a few new ones in here and some that might wind up getting pulled out. So <clears throat> my suggestion is take a look at them. If there's anything that really you know, is, is of interest to you, we can discuss these either in the October or the November meeting. We'll find whichever one, uh, the committee meetings, I'm sorry. Uh, we can uh, discuss these in our committee meetings in either October or November, whichever one has the, the shorter of the uh, agendas. So just to draw your attention to that. So um, These do get some attention too. The public gets them and mm -hmm. sends yeah. us uh, notifications or ask us if we would vote one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an interesting change in position this year in one of them. Yeah, in one of them, yeah, the, 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 the committee, the delegate uh, uh, committee uh, changed their position on one of them. So, um, and then the only other uh, update is there is a uh, our Lakes Division meeting uh, taking place a week from Wednesday. So, mm -hmm. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, I will be attending on our behalf. And if anyone else wants to join us, that's great. I have one question. Uh, the so now, Coon Carney, board member. This document, the committee report with the draft resolutions, is that also posted to our school district website? Typically? This document? Yeah. No, no, not, not typically, no. It is on the IASB uh, site, but it's not. We typically don't do that. Yeah. Are you considering asking for that? What, what? I mean, I was just wondering because Don, you just mentioned that there are some interesting things that we should look at. As a parent, I was never aware of this. So I'm just right. wondering if, if there might be other uh, community members who are interested um, or if not right now, you know, once you've discussed it, maybe we can, Provide some notes, you know, don't have to look at 500 pages, maybe here are some sections of interest. Yeah, it, it, yeah, they're, they're um, just as a, a reminder, these are sort of position um, uh, items, it's uh, belief statements and, and sort of positional uh, items that the owner association the school board uses to inform their work in Springfield to discuss with the, our legislators down there. So it's, it's nothing we typically vote on or it's nothing that typically, um, you know, impacts us directly. These are more um, uh, opinions on whether these things are important to us. Uh, and that's sort of in our committee meeting, we'll sort of get a, a, a read for uh, if anyone has strong opinions one way or the other on any of these so that I can appropriately vote in the, the meeting that I attend in November, I actually, Every delegate, every district has one vote. And uh, as a delegate, I would vote yay or nay on any of the items that are called out individually and or on sort of the consent 
uh, group. And that just gives them a, a feel for what their, uh, the delegates, uh, you know, opinion on these. So uh, it's, it, they're, they're not anything that govern us or they're not anything that we have to uh, abide by or, or respond to. It's just, these are our uh, position papers basically for, for them to, to work on. Dr. So. Denise Herman, superintendent. <clears throat> Maybe after our conversation, we could talk about if we do think, because mm -hmm. I mean, we have the school board page on the website. So I think sometimes mm -hmm. posting information about board activities or board legislation would be sure. helpful for mm -hmm. parents potentially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, feed all. I just have a brief update. Um, so I attended uh, the governing board meeting on the 25th of August. And at that meeting, we approved the budget for the uh, fiscal year of 22. And then, so we went, we went through all the documents that support that budget and it was decided that it was up for approval. Uh, and then we also approved uh, a one-year extended bargaining agreement with the STU, which stands for CEDAL Teachers Union. So it's the specific teachers that all work for the uh, CEDAL co-op. Kara Benjamin, CEDAL. Okay. Thank you That's very it. Much. The short and the long of it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. my pleasure. It's, a... it's it's a really lovely group of people who, um, just their executive board. They're they're remarkable educators. Um, but then you know, so many of their <laughs> educators attend these meetings and they just have a lovely um, positive energy about them. And the, the students that they serve, our students who are served are so lucky to be part of this cooperative. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. my pleasure. Um, anything on a future agenda items anyone wants to add or suggest? Dr. Denise Herman, superintendent. I know that um, we will be bringing the tax levy information in October um, at both the committee meeting and then for approval. Um, that's one of our typical October uh, and November. Anything else? And then we'll look at the October and November PNP for the IASB mm -hmm. resolution. So yeah. Yeah. I know we did that in November of last year. I was just looking at the history, but we'll look at both agendas and figure yeah. out. And we should probably talk in November at committee also about what sessions anybody's going to that's going to the tri conference so that we can divide and conquer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Okay. Also, I hope to bring the calendar in October and any new uh, course proposals or changes to our curriculum in November. Exciting times. Yes. It all Busy seems time. so normal. Yeah, it, all, it does. Oh my it gosh. Does. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, anything else? No. Okay, uh, have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, roll call please, Carol. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Kokarni. Aye. Get to write it. And we're finished. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>